Okay, so in the next sequence of videos, uh, we're going to talk about something really important uh, called the Kurush Kuhn Tucker um, conditions or the KKT conditions. Um, so in this first video, uh, I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to state what the theorem is um, and talk about a little bit about the intuition um, for it. Then we'll do some examples uh, and then later on we'll actually prove the theorem. Um, so let's get into it. So I'm just going to switch to my um, iPad here. Uh, so here we are uh, talking about constrained convex optimization uh, with inequality constraints. So this is something different uh, to what we talked about with Lagrange multipliers, where it was about equality uh, constraints. So where you are uh, constrained by being equal, constrained being equal to something. Uh, here, the inequality uh, constraints makes things a bit more uh, complicated. Okay, so let's um, uh, recap by looking at this uh, problem that we looked at before uh, with Lagrange multipliers. So this is where we were trying to find the maximum area uh, subject to a constraint that uh, my rectangle here or my square as it ends up being has to be um, constrained to being on this circle. Now, the thing that you uh, may or may not notice uh, here is that this problem um, could have been just as easily uh, instead of being uh, an equality constraint, having to be on the circle, um, it would have been just as easy uh, to make this uh, be, uh, be, have to be inside the circle, right? So we treated this um, uh, as the square being, the rectangle being on the circle, just because, well, I mean, if, you know, the, if, if we wanted the maximum area uh, that was less than or equal to with it, that was inside the circle, it was going to end up being uh, on the outside uh, of the circle, being connected to the to the circle here. So you know, we we ended up um, uh, finding the equality constraint, but it works just as well with the inequality constraint. Um, and the thing that you might uh, want is uh, might notice is that if the minimizer ended up being inside the circle here, we wouldn't really uh, need this lambda here. You know, this lambda could well end up being equal to zero um, for us, and that's what something that we'll explore in a bit. Okay, so we're interested in inequality constraints um, and we're interested, we're gonna be interested in multiple um, constraints here. And this is where things actually start to get a little bit trickier. So here's, a, um, a, here's an optimization problem, imagining a, an optimization problem um, with two inequality constraints. So either I'm going to be uh, within the blue circle here, uh, G1X is uh, less than or equal to zero, or we're going to be uh, inside the red circle here, uh, g2 of x uh, is less than or equal to zero. And if we're equal uh, to where we get the equals to zero in each of those constraints, we're going to be on the edge. So if we want the, um, uh, the minimizer, imagine some uh, function, imagine some sort of convex function, say, um, that's, uh, uh, that's going to be minimized subject to both of these constraints. So, you know, we're really interested in this region that's the intersection uh, of the two here. Let's highlight that, you know, let's color that in green because that's the, the, uh, the section that we're interested in here. So there's a few different things that could happen. I mean, one way to solve this, you know, sort of already have the tools to solve this, right? Like you could first solve the completely unconstrained problem and you might find the minimizer uh, somewhere, you know, you might get lucky and find the minimizers right in the middle there. And if you find that, now you would find that the, um, uh, the minimizer would be in the interior uh, of this set, in the interior of the convex set. And in which case, you know, you're in luck, the constraints don't really matter there, right? The true, if the global minima uh, is in the interior, then the constraints don't really come into this problem, right? So the constraints are both inactive. So let's write that down. Now, where it gets more complicated um, is where you have uh, the constraints landing on one or other um, uh, of the edges uh, of these constraints. So you might find that the minimizer turns out to be um, there, subject to the constraint. So on the boundary uh, of, of G1, on the boundary of the blue circle. Um, and so in that case, you know, we have constraint number one using the index uh, set notation. Uh, number one would be the active constraint uh, but number two, constraint two would be inactive, right? So what does that mean? If I'm on the boundary of the blue circle, uh, then that means that G1 of X is equal to zero. I'll write the minimizer here. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I have two is inactive, so it doesn't matter. And that's one thing that could happen. You could have the same thing 
uh, with being on the edge uh, of the red circle. Maybe we'll write that down here. So you could have G2 uh, be activated. So we could have two active and one inactive. All right, so that means that G2 of X is equal to zero, the constraint number one uh, is inactive. Uh, and then you could have something, uh, the most complicated thing that you could have here is, you know, you could have the, um, uh, you could have the minimizer be on both constraints, right? So here are uh, one and two are both active. Uh, and so that means that G1 of X star is equal to zero, G2 of X star is equal to zero. So you can actually solve this using everything that we've learned so far. You can solve the unconstrained problem uh, using steepest descent, some sort of gradient descent method. You can solve the, um, each of the constrained optimization problems, right? And um, so where uh, G1 is equal to zero and where G2 is equal to zero, uh, you could solve those using Lagrange multipliers. You could solve the combined problem where they're both equal to zero in com uh, using Lagrange multipliers as well. Um, and and then you know you get the um, you just check which of the each of each of those minimizers is the smallest, right? So in this example that I've drawn up here, there's four different uh, things to check. So the unconstrained problem, the two different constrained problems for the two different constraints, and then the uh, version where they're both um, where they're both constrained. So you've got four things to check, and you've solved that problem. So that's okay, right? We don't need any sort of anything more powerful than stuff that we've learned already. Um, to be able to do that. But think about what happens, you know, I'll write it down the bottom here. If instead of two constraints, I had lots of constraints. You know, if I have uh, 10,000 constraints, for example, um, then I don't have, um, you know, I don't have four things to check, right? I've got a, um, I've, I've got a combinatoric explosion um, of all of those different uh, constraints being turned on and off. In fact, I'd have two to the 10,000 uh, uh, options to check, uh, things to check. And that's just some astronomically huge number. Um, and so you can't actually do that um, using this or any other, uh, any other method. Um, so the tools that we've learned there um, actually break down. So that's the first point um, to make. So when there's multiple, con multiple inequality constraints, the number of things that you have to check um, is just becomes huge. There's a combinatorial explosion uh, and it blows up. So we need some more, more high powered mathematics um, to be able to deal uh, with high dimensional problems. And that's what we're gonna get to with the KKT conditions. There's one more thing to say here. Um, and that is what are the constraints doing? Um, what are the Lagrange multipliers um, doing in each of these examples? So, you know, when I uh, looked at uh, this case up here, right, if the constraint number one is active, then that means that lambda one is equal to zero. No, right, sorry, no, lambda one, sorry, I'm, I'm saying uh, uh, garbage there. Uh, if the <laughs> G one of X is equal to zero, uh, then lambda one's gotta be equal to zero, right? Um, but if the second constraint is inactive, uh, as we have up here, now here's where my brain was jumping ahead. Um, if that constraint is, in, uh, is inactive, well, I mean, it doesn't come into, it doesn't come into play. And so lambda two ends up uh, being equal um, to zero there. Um, uh, so we get that. And similarly, you know, we've got it the other way around uh, with this constraint down here in this sort of, uh, in this situation where two is the active constraint, then lambda two, ends up being positive in the Lagrange multiplier. Uh, and one is inactive. So uh, lambda one ends up being equal, um, it ends up being equal to zero there. And here, when the solution's in the interior uh, and both constraints are inactive, then that means that uh, lambda one and lambda two, both equal to zero, right? I'm just solving the unconstrained problem there. Um, and when I have both of these uh, being active, so this version down here uh, at the bottom, then I have uh, lambda one is greater than zero and lambda two is greater than zero as well. I have to turn both of them on. Um, 
So that's um, a picture of everything that can go on here. So this diagram has gotten quite complicated, but the final thing that I want to say um, about each of these little constraints that I've written up here, right? In each of these um, situations that I'm circling, every time, um, every time I check what the constraints are doing and what the lambdas are doing, each time I get that lambda i uh, times g i of x star is equal to zero each time. Because and the reason for that is that either the constraint gets turned on, right? So in this case up here, uh, g1 uh, of x star is equal to zero, but lambda one is positive. So either g1 is equal to zero and lambda is uh, positive, but the whole thing is equal to zero, or the constraint is activated. So um, for example, up here, G2 of X star is not equal to zero, but Lambda two uh, is equal to zero up here. So again, I get that um, you know, G2 uh, might not be equal to zero, but in that case, Lambda two is equal to zero. And so the product of the two things equals zero. So actually everything that goes on here in this multiple constraints problem gets encapsulated by that, right? So that's important. Um, and now that we've explored this, um, we're in a position to actually look at what the KKT, what the kurush kuhn tucker conditions actually are. So let's go to that onto the next slide. This is gonna look scary, um, but hopefully we've um, uh, edged our way into it a little bit and we can kind of see what's uh, going on here. So here's the statement of the theorem uh, of the Karush Kuhn Tucker conditions. So let's have the FBA convex function here now. Um, so the function I'm trying to optimize is going to be a convex function. So that's appearing for the first time. Uh, that didn't, we didn't, that didn't appear before, but it will appear here so that we can prove things. The convex continuously dif differentiable function uh, on the on this convex set omega, uh, where the constraints now are convex and also continuously differentiable, and I've got m of them, um, such that there is some interior to this problem. And then a necessary and sufficient condition uh, that some x star minimizes that function uh, over the convex set is that there exists a solution to this system of equations. So let's talk through what we've got here. So first, you know, let's start at the bottom. Perhaps so all these lambdas are either equal to zero um, uh, or a positive. So lambda is greater than or equal to zero. So our Lagrange multipliers um, are, are positive or zero. And that's what we had before with um, the Lagrange multipliers. My constraints have got to be less than or equal to zero. So we've got these less than or equal to zero. So we've got convex sets. And if we burn that links back to um, convex sets that we, we've talked about before. Um, let's jump up to the top. You know, the top um, expression here hopefully looks like um, uh, what we had for Lagrange multipliers. So hopefully you can kind of see here that I've got the gradient of some function f plus uh, the gradient of um, some of functions where I've tacked on uh, Lagrange multipliers. Uh, so that should hopefully be uh, reminiscent of Lagrange multipliers. And then I've got this condition here that I just talked about on the last slide which is that my Lagrange multipliers multiplied by my constraints are equal to zero. And that appears, um, that's this, uh, it's called a slackness condition. Uh, in fact, you know, that's the, um, uh, that's the name it's given. It's that idea that either the constraint is switched on, right? The constraint is active. I'm on the boundary of a constraint, in which case my Lagrange multiplier is equal to zero or the, um, or the constraint is inactive uh, in which case the Lagrange multiplier is equal to zero. Um, it, the constraint function itself is non-zero, but the product of the two uh, is always equal to zero. So that's the KKT conditions. You know, hopefully um, the top bit looks a little bit like Lagrange multipliers. The bottom stuff um, is like Lagrange multipliers as well. Um, and the middle bit is this new bit that tells us whether um, constraints are switched on and off. So the bits of this uh, theorem should look a little bit familiar to stuff that we've seen before most of it. Um, this complementary slackness condition, 
we can actually write uh, we can actually um, uh, write this uh, theorem a little bit more compactly. We can sort of um, combine these first two equations uh, together by saying uh, by basically saying that um, you know whenever the constraints are switched off, uh, whenever the constraints are inactive, so we're not in an index set of active, active constraints. Uh, then um, we set lambda a equal to zero and we just sum over uh, the active constraints, right? So those uh, uh, two expressions, we can convert into this one uh, equation here where the only difference is that I'm summing uh, over the active constraints. And that's my KKT conditions. Um, going a little bit further, hopefully you've um, uh, recognized here that, um, uh, you know, that what we're actually doing is something a lot like Lagrange multipliers, right? If I define some function uh, h, uh, which is the, um, uh, which is f of x uh, plus the sum of uh, lambda times uh, uh, my constraint functions, uh, then taking the gradient of that as we do with Lagrange multipliers gives us this expression uh, that sits up the top here. So yeah, really um, uh, what we do is we define h of x um, equals f of x uh, plus the sum of the lambda i's times uh, uh, g of x. And then we differentiate that new function exactly as we did uh, for Lagrange multipliers and set it equal to zero. Um, and that's what gives us a, a system of equations that we need to solve for our Lagrange multipliers uh, and, our, um, uh, and our minimizer. Uh, yeah, and once you have that, Right, so once you have this expression, which is exactly the same form um, differentiated as what we got from the um, Grunge multipliers, you get this idea that was um, a little bit like uh, a little bit like what we saw for Lagrange multipliers, which is that at the minimum, uh, at the minimizer, the gradient of f is equal to the negative uh, is equal to the negative of the gradient. Uh, of my constraint. So, you know, the, um, uh, if the minimizer is, is on the boundary is, in, is on the constraint, the, um, the gradient of f uh, and the gradient of the constraint point in opposite directions. Um, and another way of saying that, if you think back a few videos where we talked about convex cones, you know, this expression here is saying that the gradient of f, that the minimizer is in the convex cone um, of the gradient of my constraint for all eyes in this, uh, in, in this index set that are active. So really um, the picture that we can draw here uh, is this, it's a lot like the picture that we drew uh, for convex, um, uh, uh, for the convex cone. So uh, the gradient of F uh, either sits uh, in the convex cone of my, um, uh, of my constraints, right? So it either sits uh, in there inside the convex cone or it sits outside the convex cone uh, like in this picture here. Uh, and in which case I can draw, you know, a separating hyperplane uh, that separates uh, that separates the two. So if I do the negative gradient of F uh, in that direction, then I get a separating hyperplane. And that's um, uh, this idea of Farkas's lemma uh, again, which will be useful uh, for when we go and um, uh, actually try and prove uh, these KKT conditions. So that's all I want to say um, about that. Um, I'll stop broadcasting. And um, that's the uh, kind of the intuition uh, for the KKT conditions. You know, that one of the take home points here is that we need them um, because just uh, brute forcing uh, these constrained uh, optimization problems uh, by using um, uh, by using Lagrange multipliers again and again and again gives you this combinatoric uh, explosion of things that you do. So you can't really um, solve constrained uh, uh, optimization problems with inequality constraints for large numbers uh, of inequalities because it just blows up. Um, uh, yeah, and, the, and you know, there's this, the central idea is this idea about constraints being switched on or switched off and that coming up in this complementary slackness condition. So, that's the, the, uh, the statement uh, of the theorem. We have to prove that theorem and we will. Um, it takes a long time. Um, at first we'll do a few examples 
um, and that's what we'll talk about in the next video.